tonight what we're talking about is breaking the accident chain, specifically communication in breaking the accident chain, trying to prevent accidents in our general aviation aircraft. So what we're going to be talking about is CRM, a term that you've heard a lot about. Typically, in my experience, CRM is presented in a very boring way and something I kind of ignored for a long time in my flying career because it was really ambiguous what it was and how to use it. The general idea of good communication makes sense, but it doesn't really make a lot of sense how to actually go about implementing good CRM. So how to use CRM in GA is something that we will be talking about tonight. The communication breakdown, accident examples, barriers to effective communication, and communication tools we can use as pilots and passengers in airplanes to improve safety and going over a few scenarios as well. So a brief uh, introductory history here that we will skip through as quickly as possible because I understand is probably not very medical field, etc. Basically, it's in 1979. It was a airlines airlines in the 1980s. It was implemented to help interpersonal communication, poor decision making, and a lack of leadership skills. United Airlines was the first one to bring this in to their flight training department in 1981 to try to improve team building, decision making, situational awareness, stress management, and breaking the error chain. So, what does it all mean for us? Well, by the 1990s, it was expanded from the cockpit to include not just the pilot or basically the captain and the first officer. It was not just the pilots, also the flight attendants now, maintenance, dispatch, ATC, etc. So we expanded CRM to include all of your resources. So it wasn't necessarily cockpit resource management anymore. It became crew resource management, the entire flight crew, pilots, flight attendants, maintenance, dispatch, etc. Now, CRM is now required by AQP, which is part of the new training programs that all the airlines are adopting. So basically, this is being fully integrated into the aviation training spectrum in the airlines, and we're trying to bring it more into general aviation. You see SRM or CRM talked a lot about in the new ACS, Airman Certification Standards for Private Instrument Commercial Pilot Applicants, and CRM is now required by the FAA and ICAO in over 185 countries. So it's been rolled into the training programs of everyone everywhere because it's understood that this generally helps reduce accidents a whole heck of a lot. Ultimately, the CRM statistics and benefits here are that 60% of U.S. Navy and Marine Corps accidents from 1991 to 2000 involved CRM failure in the cockpit. ASRS reports 70% of incidents involved inadequate communication of information. So the aviation safety and reporting system, basically those anonymous reports we send when things go wrong, 70% of them involve inadequate communication. So we need to improve our communication, or so it seems. Now, moving into threat and error management, these fancy terms the airlines like to use in their training departments, still applicable to general aviation flying, 98% of flights face threats, meaning... Well, really, I kind of disagree with that statistic. I'd say 100% of flights face threats, something like a short runway or birds on takeoff, or perhaps there's some inoperative equipment on the aircraft. Anything like that would be considered a threat. And typically, there's always threats to us in general aviation aircraft. I mean, come on, we're down to one engine, typically single pilot, no de-icing equipment, and uh, typically one radio or maybe two radios at the most, not always IFR equipped. Lots of things that are not really going for us. Now, 82% of flights have errors, and I would agree with that, possibly even a higher number. It's rare that you ever have a perfect flight. I don't know that I ever have had a perfect flight, meaning that I've used all the checklists perfectly. I've done a perfect pre-flight. I have executed a perfect takeoff and perfect landing and held altitude perfectly, held a heading perfectly, all that. I doubt that's ever happened in over 5,000 hours of flying for myself. Perhaps you guys feel different. Maybe it's happened for you, but certainly not for me yet. So I'd say almost 100% of flights face threats and almost 100% of flights have some errors involved. Now, as far as um, other numbers we can talk about here, 70% decrease in crashes since the inception of CRM. That applies mostly to the airlines. So in the 70s and 80s, we were getting pretty good at wrecking big airplanes in the airlines. And since we've brought CRM on board and tried to break down some barriers between the captain, first officer, and other resources that are available, well, we've seen a large increase in safety and that decrease in crashes. A couple big name accidents we'll talk about tonight are going to be Korean Air 801, Air Florida 90, Avianca 52, and Air France 447, and we'll also talk about some GA incidents as well. 
Now, moving in here to Korean Air 801, it was a flight from Seoul to Guam. The captain was pretty experienced, 9,000 hours, and he had just got a wonderful award for flight safety. The FO had 4,000 hours, and the flight engineer was the most experienced of all of them with 13,000 hours. Of course, he had 13,000 hours flying sideways, sitting at that panel, not actually at the controls of the aircraft, but operating as a flight engineer. Now, as you can probably imagine, especially back in these days, the actual hierarchy is obviously going to be very regimented to captain, FO, and FE. Now, the Guam glide slope where they were going was out of service, so there's a threat to the flight. The captain tried to use it anyways. That's probably not the best idea, but how come nobody reminded them that, hey, it's out of service? The aircraft was descending at 1,400 feet per minute, at 840 feet MSL. So pretty low to the ground, coming down at a pretty good rate. That's a 747. There's a lot of inertia in that thing. When the jip whiz, the ground proximity warning system, first sounded, is when they were coming through 840 feet. Now, the wind was variable at 4 knots, visibility 5 miles, and light rain shower, sky condition, few at 1,500, scattered 2,500 feet, overcast 4,000. They should have been in relatively not-so-great VFR conditions, yet in VFR. Now, the captain descended the aircraft below MDA and impacted terrain three nautical miles from the runway threshold, killing 228 people. Why did that happen? Why did the captain just bust right on through the glide slope and nobody mention it to him? Jump in here into Air Flora, Washington, D.C. to Fort Lauderdale. The airport had been closed earlier due to a snowstorm, so they're trying to go from Washington, D.C. during the wintertime. The flight had arrived late and departed late, and the crew neglected to turn on the heat for the engine probes. They didn't complete a checklist appropriately. The ground crew de-iced the aircraft with the improper mixture of glycol and water, so a lot really helping get all the ice off the aircraft and keep the ice off. And then the aircraft departed runway 1 in DCA, 7,000-foot-long runway, and was airborne for 30 seconds, reaching all the way up to 352 feet before losing altitude and stalling pretty much due to improper engine settings. They weren't getting full power, partially due to the engine probe heat not being turned on, and the ice on the wings and airframe certainly did not help the situation. 70 of the 74 passengers died, and four more people on the ground died as well when they impacted the bridge just north of DCA there. Why would that happen? There's a lot of things that went wrong here, right? They're running late, you know, the bad weather, under some pressure, they skipped through a checklist, they've got bad de-icing fluid, and did this all still have to happen? Well, we'll talk about why maybe it didn't. Avianca 52. That was a flight that departed Medellin, Colombia for JFK. The captain had 16,000 hours, the FO had 1,837 hours, and the FE 10,000 hours. The flight was given holding instructions three times, working their way up to New York. So it took a very long time for them to get there, burning a lot of fuel. The crew advised ATC that they were running out of fuel. ATC cleared them for an ILS approach and landing, however, due to the wind shear and inoperative autopilot and the crew being very fatigued coming all the way up from Medellin to JFK and having to hold three times, the captain descended well below the glide slope and executed a go-around. So, now they're being vectored for the second approach, and the Boeing 707 ran out of fuel. 73 of 150... Uh, 158 people on board were killed. I know I can talk, I think. <laughs> so of that, why did they run out of fuel? Why would a Boeing 707 with a fairly experienced flight crew, 16,000 hours on the captain, the FO, fairly junior, 1,800 hours, and the FE, 10,000 hours, how did they run an airplane out of gas? One of the most basic things. The airplane doesn't go anywhere without gas. And they advised ATC they were running out of gas. We'll take a look at that in a few minutes here. Air France 447, Rio de Janeiro to Paris. This one might be a little bit more familiar to y'all because it happened a lot more recently. I believe it was back in 2008-ish, somewhere in that range. Two hours into the flight, the aircraft encountered storms somewhere out over the Atlantic Ocean and icing conditions at 35,000 feet. The two FOs were in the cockpit while the captain rested in the cabin and the PO tubes iced over and the computer lost airspeed information. So, the autopilot disconnected, and the junior FO took the controls. Now, on that Airbus, on that A330, they don't have yokes that are sitting in between your legs there that are really obvious what you're doing. They have those side sticks. So the FO taking the controls really just means he put his feet on the rudder pedals, maybe, because it's an Airbus, so why do you even need to use the rudders? And he put his right hand over on that side stick, 
at night in a dark cockpit and started manipulating that side stick. So through the miscommunication between the pilots, the junior FO repeatedly raised the nose of the airplane, exceeding 30 degrees angle of attack, and stalled the airplane. That A330 descended for over three minutes at 10,000 feet per minute. They had two first officers on the flight deck at that point. Remember, the captain's in back resting, so they've got kind of a more experienced first officer sitting in the captain's seat, and then a junior FO sitting in the right seat there. They descended for over three minutes at 10,000 feet per minute, and then the aircraft disintegrated when it hit the ocean at 108 knots vertical speed, killing all 228 on board instantly. Now, did that have to happen? And why did it happen? Obviously, they had some mechanical issues, right? They had the issue with the uh, pitot tubes icing over there. So let's jump here now and to talk about why some of these things are happening in airplanes. Mitigated speech is what we want to talk about here. So, mitigated speech is the idea that we're going to maybe downplay the significance of something we're trying to say. You can say, how does this apply to me as a general aviation pilot? Well, I'll give you an example here, something that we've all probably experienced when we first got into flying. As confident as you might have been in your business life or in what you do for work, you probably showed up to the flight school when you were first getting your prior pilot certificate, and when you had one hour in your logbook, or perhaps just two hours in your logbook, you looked at guys that had 15 hours in their logbook and had just soloed, and you're like, wow, they just soloed. And then you look at guys that are working on their instrument rating, you're like, wow, he's working on an instrument rating, he's got so much experience, that's crazy. I wonder if I'll ever do that. And you probably looked at them, and if they were to go out and do something that you felt was wrong, you might not actually speak up and say so, because they're more experienced than you. I can give you an example for me. I had about an hour in my logbook, if that. Obviously, at that point, I knew it didn't quite look right to see an airplane turn a beacon on when there was still chocks on the nose wheel on a 172, and a guy was about to fire it up. And I was like, man, you shouldn't start up an airplane with chocks on the nose wheel. And I was like, well, I barely know what I'm talking about because I have one hour in my logbook right now. Maybe that's normal. I don't know what he's trying to do. But he fired up, tried to use a bunch of power to go forward, figured out that, oh, yeah, there's chocks here, shut down, got out, pulled the chocks, and then kind of looked at me across the ramp and was like, hey, man, why don't you tell me that there's chocks in my nose wheel? And I kind of shrugged my shoulders like, I thought you knew what you were doing. I had like an hour in my logbook, man. I, I have no idea what's going on here. So I thought that you were meaning to do that. Basically, I knew it didn't look right. It gave me a feeling in my stomach something felt wrong, but I didn't bother to wave my arms or speak up and tell him, hey, don't start up, you know, or hey, shut down. Don't try to use all the power and try to taxi over that stuff because I wasn't sure. I felt that he obviously knew a lot more than me, and I felt inferior, so I just kept my mouth shut, and a minor bad thing happened. He fired up, tried to taxi, not a big deal, got out, pulled the chocks. But that's a similar scenario that you could extrapolate to me getting in an airplane with maybe a few hours in my logbook, or perhaps just a private pilot certificate, or perhaps even a commercial pilot certificate, and getting in there with an airline pilot. I could be a CFI with 250 hours and throw an airline pilot in the left seat with 20,000 hours. Who am I to tell him how to fly an airplane? Who am I to tell him how, what he's supposed to do and what he's not supposed to do? You have to have confidence in your own training and your own ability. And even if you're not 100% sure, and that's usually when these cases come about, you're not 100% sure, you have to at least speak up and it's okay to say so. Hey, uh, hey, excuse me, sir, just a sec. Uh, you got chocks in your nose. Well, did you mean to have... Oh, you did? Okay, cool. Sorry. I'm, I'm a new student pilot, and, you know, as a student pilot, I didn't know if that's normal or not. Oh, it's normal? Cool. That's fine. So maybe you feel like you look like an idiot for a second, but, hey, better than he started up with chocks and not know it. In all reality, if you told him that, he'd go, oh, wait. Oh, no, thanks. Good catch. So it's okay to speak up, and mitigated speech is when we start to downplay the significance of what we're saying. The opposite of mitigated speech would be, be running up to him and waving my arms and saying, don't start up, there's chocks on your nose. And him getting out and going, yeah, I was not intending to taxi this airplane anywhere. I put them there for safety so it wouldn't roll. And yeah, that's supposed to be there. So there's somewhere in the happy middle where we want to be to actually be able to speak up and communicate clearly. In the terms of, or in the example of Avianca 52, what we have here is the cockpit voice recordings from that night. And we see, yeah, the uh, 
actual CAM, that's going to be the microphone in the cockpit picking them up. And then radio is going to be what they're transmitting. And then tower, of course, is what the tower is saying. So he's saying, uh, yeah, that's right to uh, 180 on the heading. And uh, we'll try once again. Uh, we're running out of fuel. Tower says, okay. So we're running out of fuel is not a great communication to use with ATC when you're actually running out of fuel. Technically, all aircraft are running out of fuel from the moment you start up. You're not making any fuel. There's no oil refinery on board your Cessna 172 making fuel. So yeah, as soon as we fire up to go take off, we're running out of fuel. When we jump down here and listen to the actual radio communications, you can get a feel for what New York approach is talking or what New York approach is saying to the aircraft and what the first officer is saying on the radio. Arianka 052, heavy New York, good evening, climb maintain 3000. Climb maintain 3000 and uh, we're running out of fuel. Okay, uh, fly heading is 082. And Avianca 052 Heavy, uh, I'm going to bring you about 15 miles northeast and then turn you back on for the approach. Is that fine with you and your fuel? I guess so, thank you very much. Avianca 52, climb maintain 3000. Uh, negative sir, we, we're just running out of fuel. We, we're good. Okay, 3000, I'll be good. Okay, turn left heading 310, sir. Avianca 052, we just uh, lost two engines and we need the priority, please. Avianca 052, turn left heading 250, intercept the localizer. Roger. Avianca 052, you have, uh, uh, you have enough fuel to make it to the airport? Okay, so the first officer says we're running out of fuel, and everyone knows they're running out of fuel. The first officer knows it, the flight engineer knows it, the captain knows it. Why wasn't he a little bit more forceful with ATC? Was it possible that there was any sort of mitigated speech going on where he didn't want to forcefully tell ATC exactly what he needed because he's a not-so-experienced first officer sitting next to a very experienced flight engineer and a very experienced captain. Was he being as forceful and as clear in his communication as he really needed to be? Well, probably not. Now let's apply this to general aviation, flying our 172s, our Piper Cherokees, and all that. To do this, I want you guys to go ahead and call in to that number, 234-738-2582, and we're going to get whoever is brave enough to call in to come on here live and chat with us, and you are going to be... Uh, basically playing along with us to see what you would do in this scenario. So go ahead and give us a call at 234-738-2582, and we'll get you connected here. Now, the scenario that we're going to be talking about is you're flying along with a friend, all right? It's your only your second time that you've flown together, and you barely know each other through your local flying club. Now, your CFI recommended that, hey, you should give this guy a call. You know, he's going through a similar part of training as you. You're both working on your commercial. And, uh, you know, you're both technically legal to go fly IMC, but both of you aren't maybe so prof proficient. So he's going to go up and fly, and you're going to be a safety pilot for him. And that'd be a really good way for you to log some flight time, get some more experience, and it would help him out. And you're like, yeah, sure, that sounds great. Maybe make a new friend. But you barely know each other. So you guys file an IFR flight plan. And he's PIC, he's legally responsible for the flight, he's legally current, and you're there just to kind of help out, make sure things are safe, make sure he doesn't get disoriented, you're just there as a safety pilot. So, whoever that was calling in, thank you, and we'll go ahead and turn the volume off on the phone. But uh, you're flying along, and you're an IMC here, so th this is the scenario. There's reports of embedded cumulonimbus in the area, and you're in IMC. Not a great place to be in a little airplane. And you notice a radar return up ahead that is bright red. So, you're looking up ahead, and you go, oh. And looking at the iPad, you see it coming through ADS-B, and you're like, that doesn't look so good. And you know that on your iPad, I mean, heck, that could be probably 
10, 15, 20 minutes old by the time you're looking at it, it's about 20 miles up ahead. So 20 miles ahead, right on your path, you're going to fly right through the middle of this big red blob that's like probably six or eight miles wide. And you're like, oh, that doesn't sound good. And you know there's reports of embedded cumulonimbus in the area. Could just be heavy rain. Could just, you know, be moderate rain. Could be a thunderstorm. So you're flying along there in dead silence. He's focusing on flying the airplane. You're not, you're trying not to distract him. What do you say? So what are you going to say to him? So who's the uh, lucky victim that called in? Oh, goodness. Hello. <laughs> My name is Patrick. <laughs> Patrick, hi. Well, welcome. And uh, thank you for uh, calling in here. So yeah, uh, you, uh, you're you watching along here with us. So you got this scenario? Uh, looks like it. I was half focusing on calling and half uh, reading here, so. Sure, no worries. And maybe just a quick recap. Absolutely. So uh, you are part of a flying club, and you're uh, going to be a safety pilot for this guy who is going to uh, go up. He's going to be PIC. He's legally current to fly an IMC, and you're going to be a safety pilot for him just for an extra set of eyes as he's flying along an IMC trying to get more proficient, even though he's legally current. And you guys get your weather brief. There's reports of embedded cumulonimbus in the area. And as you're cruising along, you look at the iPad and you notice on that ADSB weather that there's a radar return up ahead and it's bright red. It's about six to eight miles wide. It's about 20 miles up ahead of you. And your course is going to take you right through it. And he's just flying along in that heading. He's not saying anything. You're flying along in dead silence. What would you say to him? Um, well, I would let him know that, hey, um, I don't know if you noticed, but the, uh, the iPad does show some some radar stuff up ahead of us. Maybe we could ask uh, ATC if they've got any ride reports. Maybe if uh, if we're not feeling good about it, we can ask for some deviations or something just to give us that that uh, early lead on getting around it if we have to. And he looks at me and goes, okay. All right. Um, well, I mean, if he's not acting up on it. Um, well, you're still 20 we... miles away. I mean, hey, 20 miles, okay. you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I would remind him that 20 miles is usually <laughs> the closest you want to get to any thunderstorms. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so maybe make a radio call just to ask, like maybe take the comms and just say, hey, I'm going to call up ATC real quick and let them know that we've seen some stuff up ahead of us and what they want us to do to avoid it. Cool. Yeah. No, so that's pretty good. So um, I know there's probably a little bit of lag time between us talking on the phone here and what you're seeing on YouTube. Um, oh, but yeah. this next slide here, uh, basically – We've got a couple different options in terms of mitigated speech. How mitigated do you want to make your speech? And that's a pretty good, pretty good thing to do. I'd say that, you know, that probably is a good start anyways to getting you to go around that weather or figuring out if you could go through it. I mean, certainly little airplane 172 or Cherokee. What do you fly? Uh, I started in the 172. I'm flying out in the archers right now. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I mean, you know, taking an archer through that big red blob might be kind of an interesting day. So, uh, We've got a couple different things we could do. We could start off with a hint. I mean, you don't really know the guy, so you don't want to step on his toes. And, I mean, right. he's got more hours than you anyway, so you're trying to be kind of nice. And you're not sure what to say. So you'd start off with a hint like, hey, man, that return out there at 20 miles looks kind of mean. He just looks at you and stares, you know. And yeah. You're like, oh, <laughs> man. The next option, you could yeah. do kind of a preference statement. I think it would be wise to turn left or right. Again, he just kind of looks at you and stares. Or maybe he goes, oh, yeah, we could, we could probably turn right. Hey, you want to ask ATC? And, but maybe he just stares at you. You could do a query statement, and we could call this a query statement, or we could call it a calibrated question, is what I usually call them. Which direction would you like to deviate as you kind of point at the screen and show that big red blob that's, you know. I start thinking about actually yeah, making so, a decision. Yeah, now, he, I mean, you asked him a question. So now, I mean, that should solicit an answer. I mean, if it just solicits a stare from him, you're like, this guy's <laughs> so asleep. What's he doing over there? Out, yeah. yeah. And then you could do a crew suggestion statement. Let's go around the weather. That's cool, but I'm a big fan of the query statements as a starting point. 20 miles is pretty close, but um, assuming that, you know, you could get, you know, you're still 10 minutes from it or so. Not that you want to get closer than 20 miles, but, you know, um, the uh, crew suggestion, let's go around the weather. That's a nice suggestion. The next level up from that would be an obligation statement. I think we need to deviate right about now or left about now. And then there's the command statement. Turn 30 degrees right. Turn 20 degrees left. Well, obviously, nobody's going to start out with a command, you know, and right. that's just, it makes things pretty awkward, right? But yeah. I think where you were starting out was a pretty good place. And where I like to start out with these is at least at the query level, at least at that calibrated question level of which direction would you like to deviate? So yeah. we, I'm telling you, hey, I think this is a problem. Just by me asking the question, I've stated 
this is a problem. Similar to how, what you said. Hey, you know, we're getting pretty close to that. That looks pretty bad. We should we should figure out something. You know, we should ask ATC some ride reports. Can we go through it? Or we should just ask them for the deviation now. So, right. yeah, that's a great spot to turn or, or a great spot to start anyways. And uh, that's what we're looking at here with mitigated speeches. There's different levels that we can go at. And the hints typically don't work out so well, <laughs> especially right. if yeah. you're hinting. It might be because... You just feel kind of in fear to the guy. Maybe he's got that big personality, you know, that just takes up the whole cockpit. You know, he's sure. one of those, yep. you know, five foot wide personalities. That's just like anything you say is totally wrong and he knows everything. And so right. you go, oh, man, I don't want to say the wrong thing and look like an idiot. So you hint, but that might not be getting you in the best spot there. So anyways, Patrick, I appreciate you calling in. And um, you got any questions so far on what we've been talking about? Uh, no, I think this is fantastic. I really, uh, really uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. I'm in a CFI training right now, and your videos and everything have been a huge help. So awesome, man. So thank you man. very much for the opportunity. Well, congratulations, yeah, on uh, on getting through the commercial and everything. And any questions you have on CFI, definitely get a hold of us. Uh, you know the office number or um, get a hold of us through uh, through email and stuff. Anything we can do to help you out, let us know, and we'll, uh, we'll keep moving along with the presentation here. Great, John. Thank you so much. Have a great night. You too. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you to Patrick for playing along. It's always fun when uh, I get to talk to somebody instead of just sit here and talk to a microphone, and I hope my microphone's listening. Uh, Anyways, CRM ingredients. What are some good ingredients for good CRM? Well, communication's key, right? Communication's pretty loaded. That's what this whole presentation's about. Leadership skills is a good thing. What are leadership skills? Again, kind of vague. Decision-making, you got to make a decision. Can't be indecisive. Teamwork really important, using all of those resources. That's what CRM really is all about, using all of your resources. First, before you can use all your resources, you have to identify what they are. You have to know what the resources are. If you're flying along a single pilot in that 172 or in an Archer, you need to know, what are all my resources? My iPad, I've got ATC, I've got flight service, I've got other airplanes around me, I've got other airplanes on CTAF, if I could switch to a nearby CTAF frequency, I could probably solicit some pyreps from guys flying at an airport. Well, if I'm at 10,000 feet, I could probably get pyreps from up to 75 miles, maybe even 100 miles away on CTAF, if there's people flying over in that area, because my radio will reach that far. Think outside the box of all of those different resources that you actually have. That'll help you maintain situational awareness and make sure that you're monitoring those resources, instruments, monitoring what's going on with the flight. Cross-checking instruments certainly helps. And stress management. You should be afraid of certain types of flights. You should be afraid of taking off or landing on short runways, narrow runways, high wind scenarios. You should be afraid of bad weather. But once you're already in a bad situation because you made some bad decisions to get into it, you need to be, forgive the language, the cockiest pilot out there and be absolutely sure you're going to pull it off. If you have gotten yourself in a situation where you got 30 minutes of fuel on board and every airport within 100 miles of you is gusting 35 to 40 knots, you better be real confident you can land in 35 or 40 knots. If you're unsure of it, you're going to get real stressed out and it's going to make your performance suffer a little bit there. You shouldn't be in that situation anyways. You should have enough fuel on board to fly 100 or 200 miles away to where it's only gusting 15 knots. But if you're in a situation that you shouldn't have got yourself in in the first place and you need to get out of it, being stressed or worrying about it is not going to help. You're going to have to be very, very confident in whatever skill you got, knowing that it's enough to get you through, or it's at least enough to walk away from whatever situation you got yourself into, even if it means you might be sliding off the runway because, hey, you didn't do very good pre-flight planning, or perhaps the weather changed on you, and now you're going to be landing in that 30-knot crosswind, and it's probably not going to work out so well, and you're going to have to just deal with it. Now, those scenarios don't happen to us too often, luckily, in the lower 48. Lots of airports around, especially on the eastern side of the United States, where you're likely to be able to find a runway oriented into the wind and all that. But get yourself out west, get yourself into Alaska, get yourself into some more remote, unpopulated areas. Airports get fewer and farther between, and sometimes weather shuts down a lot of those options pretty quickly. You can find yourself in those nasty scenarios best thing is keep yourself out of those scenarios. That's a whole other topic for another day. We could talk for an hour or more about keeping options open for yourself and knowing how to do so. And we plan to in a later presentation. And then, of course, this feeds right into understanding one's limitations. Know what your limits are so you don't get yourself into that scenario. Be honest with yourself about what you and your airplane can really do. 
jumping back into mitigated speech here, how that played into the Air Florida accident. I got this cute little meme here that we downloaded from uh, Google. The single biggest problem in communication is the illusion it has taken place. Said by some older gentleman before my time, I don't recognize the name. But it's pretty applicable. The biggest problem you could have when you're talking is the illusion that someone has actually heard you and understood what you said. The first officer in the Air Florida accident starts making some very mitigated statements, some very mitigated hints. Look at how the ice is just uh, hanging on his uh, back there. You see that? Trying to tell the captain, hey, look at that other airplane over there all loaded up. We're loaded up with ice too, but he doesn't want to speak up and say so. See all those uh, icicles on the back there and everything? Ugh, like, he's thinking, I don't know how much ice we got. I can't really see behind me very well on this airplane. I'm guessing if he's got a bunch, we got a bunch too. We should probably do something about it. He's not saying that, though. He's saying, you see all those icicles on the back there and everything? Not very clear and easy to understand. And then he says, boy, this is a losing battle here and trying to de-ice these things. It, it gives you a false sense of security. That's all that does. Let's go ahead and listen to the actual cockpit voice recorder from this incident. the end of that you hear the captain in the background going forward forward just just barely climb you only want 500 they made it up to 352 feet before the airplane started stalling and descending down into the river and hitting the bridge before it hit the river the captain is sitting there saying hey, forward forward just just barely climb it's pretty typical on any jet to rotate after takeoff to about 15 degrees climb angle or deck angle as they refer to it Probably at that point, if they ever had a chance of actually making this airplane fly, maybe it wasn't survival. Maybe they were going to crash no matter what. But maybe what they really wanted was only five or six degrees nose up, not rotating to what the first officers used to. So what they needed to do here is not say forward, you know, forward, just, just barely climb, just, just barely. Instead, maybe somebody needed to get their hand on the yoke and lower that nose. Maybe it would have worked out, but between... The engine's not producing full power due to them neglecting that checklist and getting ice on the probes, and the airplane being all iced up with bad de-ice fluid, plus them not taking the time to go back and get de-iced again because they were kind of in a rush. The FO was hinting at it, hinting like, hey, you know, this isn't good. We probably got a bunch of ice on us. We should go get de-iced again. They totally didn't know about the, uh, the lapse on the checklist. He hinted at it, and the captain didn't take the bait. Didn't know because he was using a hint. He wasn't working his way up that mitigated statement list all the way up to a direct order, we need to go back and get de-iced again. Turn right here and go back to the de-ice pad. That's what really needed to be said. But that's a hard thing to say. And you might ruffle some feathers doing so. You're going to have to make sure your communication skills are good enough that you're getting that clear point across, either using those words or being more artistic and using others. But if you're not getting that point across, hey, we needed to go back to the de-ice pad immediately before takeoff, then you're not doing your job as a pilot as an FO, as a captain, as a flight engineer, or just as a passenger on board an aircraft. If you're a pilot-rated passenger, perhaps you're flying with another pilot in a GA aircraft, whatever it is, you need to be able to speak up and communicate your point clearly. Communication errors. Kim Jong, when I said nuke the Chinese, I meant put the takeout in the microwave. And that's how World War III started. Kind of uh, hope that never actually happens. And then here, with punctuation, how things are said makes a big difference. Let's eat, Grandma. Or, let's eat 
Grandma. Punctuation saves lives. All right. Everyone is familiar with Little Red Riding Hood, hopefully. How things are said makes all the difference in the world. Because we oftentimes talk while we're thinking and our brains are really occupied by a lot of things going through our heads as we're sitting in the cockpit, whether you're sitting in the left seat or right seat or whatever, it was really easy to jump into the cockpit on a 152 when I was a student pilot, jump into the right seat of a CRJ when I was working in the airlines. And as soon as you sat in that seat as a newer pilot, as a student pilot in the Cessna or as a new FO trainee in the simulator, man, you lost a lot of IQ points pretty quick. And that oftentimes leads us to say things and have words come out of our mouth in a way that we don't necessarily mean them. The way we say things, punctuation, makes a big difference in how what we're saying is going to be interpreted. Now, why mitigate your speech? We talked about some reasons of perhaps feeling a little bit inferior. There's some other reasons that some of the experts and the psychology types have picked out. Things like power distance index. So, what is power distance index? That is when you have a large power distance or a feeling of inequality between somebody like a CEO and a janitor. So, in countries like Brazil, South Korea, Morocco, Mexico, Philippines, well, you're probably not going to have the janitor look a CEO in the eye and say, sir, you dropped your trash on the ground. Whereas in Ireland, United States, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, that's a little bit more likely to happen. Now, that's an overgeneralization about cultures and countries, and generalizations are never, ever 100% accurate. But they exist in these academic type studies for a reason, because they're somewhat true. There's some truth to them anyways. Where this comes into play is when we start talking about the culture you're raised in. It doesn't really mean that just because you come from the United States that you're guaranteed to have a low power distance index or a low power distance complex in your mind where you don't see a big difference between you growing up in a trailer park and the kid who grew up on the beach house. In countries like Morocco, there's a big difference when you come from a higher caste, or in Korea. But in the United States, we have less of that. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. For this example, from Korea, if you're at a dinner table, a lower-ranking person must wait to eat until a higher-ranking person sits down and starts eating. One does not smoke in the presence of a social superior. When drinking with a social superior, the subordinate hides their glass and turns away from the superior to take a drink. In greeting a social superior, a Korean must bow. A Korean must rise when an obvious social superior appears on the scene, and he cannot pass in front of the social superior. The phrase below, I know I would totally butcher, so I won't even try it, but it basically means even in drinking water, there is an order to it. So, who gets to drink the water first? There is an order to things in that culture. It's a beautiful thing, really. It's a very structured culture. It's something that we can look at from the outside, living here in the States, and appreciate that culture. But I think we can all see where that similar culture, if you grow up in that, and that is ingrained in you from age zero to age 25, and now you're sitting in the right seat of a cockpit with a social superior, someone who's a captain who came from a much higher caste than you, and you are just a first officer who came from a working class family, you may not be so willing to speak up. Certain cultures around the world, you're better off keeping your mouth closed and letting the airplane crash and dying than speaking up, offending someone, and bringing dishonor and shame to your family. We can sit here and say, well, that's preposterous, and that's, that's ridiculous. But that's the fact of their culture, and we have to respect that. We also have to respect that if our goal is aviation safety, that those cultures have no place in the cockpit. And just to say because you grew up in the United States as a white male, that doesn't mean that you have a low power distance index. That's probably the average viewer right now on our podcast or right now on our YouTube channel watching this presentation. And that's fine, but there's no guarantee that that situation exists. And I can guarantee you that in some point in your life, that situation does not exist. When you showed up for the very first day of school to high school as a freshman, did you feel like you were just as cool and just as knowledgeable and just as smart and just as great as the seniors showing up for their first day of their senior year? When you showed up for your very first flight lesson, did you feel equal to your flight instructor that was giving you that lesson? If your flight instructor was doing something that was obviously unsafe, were you going to speak up to them? We can say that in some of these high power distance index cultures, they certainly would not, and in low power distance cultures, we would. But the reality is, there are certain situations in our life that we will have a high power distance index, even when we're living in these low power distance index cultures. 
Just because you're from Australia and Qantas is one of the safest airlines in the world doesn't mean that a low time FO feels inferior to a captain with 30,000 hours and the captain deviating from a procedure or skipping a checklist or doing something wrong. It would be very difficult for that FO with say only 500 hours to speak up to him. That's a common situation that any of us can find ourselves in and it's key that when we find ourselves in those situations that we actually speak up. We can mitigate our speech slightly. We don't have to just blindly issue commands because, yeah, a lot of the times you don't know. You may look dumb, you may be wrong, and you may get a bad reputation for it. But you can still issue statements and not even at the hinting level. You can still ask questions. You can even use accusation audits or mitigating statements in front of your question, such as, hey, I know I'm pretty new here. I don't know a lot about this airplane or don't know a lot about this stuff, but is that red light supposed to be blinking? You know, is, uh, I don't know about a lot about this airplane, but isn't that gear lever supposed to be all the way down or is it normal for it to be about halfway there? Things like that can mitigate the statement, make it easier to ask your question without seeming so direct. Of course, direct is always the most important or the best, especially when time is of the essence. Sometimes if you're about to flare and you're 50 feet over the runway and you notice, oh my gosh, the gear lever is up, You don't have time to ask questions. All you can say is go around. Now you go around and then you realize, oh my gosh, that was a different lever and I'm totally dumb. And the person flying goes, why did you say go around? And the captain flying or perhaps whoever you were flying with executes the go around. And why'd you tell me to do that? I'm so sorry. I thought that lever was the gear lever and it looked up and they might think you're dumb or whatever. At the end of the day, you're gonna have to be confident enough in yourself to handle those situations. To say, look, I did my best. I'm sorry. And they're going to have to be a good enough pilot, a good enough person to live with that and say, okay. Anyone who has been in aviation long enough won't hold it against you for very long. They may look at you and be like, wow, you really don't know what you're talking about. Well, of course, maybe you're just a new student pilot flying along with somebody in a 172 who's far more experienced than flying for 20 years. And they're about to land gear up and you save them from doing so. It's okay to tailor your speech to the situation But always avoid those hint statements. Make sure you're issuing a strong enough statement that can be understood. Don't allow your communication to be an illusion. Don't be under the illusion that communication is actually taking place. Here's an instance of mitigated speech for myself. I already gave you one scenario when I was a brand new pilot. Here's another one that I messed up on. So, down here in Venice, Florida, I was flying a Piper Cherokee from Michigan up to uh, or from Michigan down to Florida to build time, flew around for two weeks, built a bunch of time, just got my instrument rating, had maybe about 100, 120 hours, my logbook somewhere in there. Then I flew from Venice on up to Tampa about 9 a.m., met up with a buddy for lunch, had lunch, and then got out of there, made all the way up to Gainesville until a line of thunderstorms blocked me from getting any further north. It extended all over the entire state. Stayed in Gainesville for about five hours or more, about 6 p.m. It was getting late in the day. It was pretty tired. But I said, hey, I'm going to push on. The thunderstorms have died out. And I took off, climbed up into IMC, flew along about 8,000 feet or so, all the way up towards Knoxville on about a four and a half, five hour flight. Cruising along, trying to stretch that (laughs) a little bit of fuel I put in the airplane. Pretty broke as a flight training student, running along at 2,100 RPM or something, barely crawling along at 70 some knots, trying to build flight time and save money on fuel get up there to Knoxville, and I'm going to be landing there, oh, somewhere around almost 11 or or midnight. It was pretty late in the day. I had been flying solid IMC, single pilot, with 120 hours in my logbook, and at night, just flying along, no autopilot, and just talking about that makes me go, what in the heck was I thinking back then? But I did it, and anyways, somewhere south here, about maybe 30 miles from the airport or so, I got a clearance out of 8,000 feet down to 4,000 feet. And I read back the clearance. I'm looking at my VFR sectional chart, and I'm looking at the IFR chart, and I'm going, man, that doesn't seem quite right. And and so I query them and try to verify the clearance. Yeah, I think I must have got stepped on or something by some other airplane. There's a lot of other airliners going into Knoxville, and I'm kind of intimidated as a brand-new instrument-rated pilot. And so I don't really get that clarification I wanted on my clearance down to 4,000 feet. But I start descending like I'm supposed to, and I'm thinking, well, hey, even though these numbers are pretty high around here, maybe their MVA is a lot lower and I'm already clear of this terrain, so I'll just keep on going, and I guess that's what I'm supposed to do. And about 7,500 feet, I check back in about a minute later, and I say, hey, I'd like to request the ILS for runway 24 left. 
and the response I get from the controller is, we're using the visual tonight. Okay, and so I just kind of shut up because all these other airliners are talking on the frequency. I feel like, man, okay, I shouldn't have even said that. My bad. I guess I'll just do the visual. I'd feel a lot more comfortable at night. I'm not familiar with this airport. There's a bunch of mountains in the area. It's kind of unlit terrain here and there. I'd love to just shoot the ILS and make it really easy myself. But okay, I'll just do the visual and keep descending. Then somewhere around 7,000 feet, Atlanta Center called Knoxville Approach on the landline and said, hey, what's this airplane doing descending through the 7,000? They called me, and that, by that time I was probably about 6,500 feet, and they said climb maintain 7,000 immediately because I was below the MVA. They had given me a clearance that they meant to give to another aircraft. So you land, you have the worst night of your life because they give you a telephone number to call. You call two months later, somebody from the FA calls you, they say they listen to the tapes, and yeah, they gave you a clearance down to 4,000. And I said, yes, yeah, sir, I read it back, and I started descending. And then I tried to check in with them and, and verify because it didn't seem quite right. And he's like, yeah, and you got stepped on and you didn't keep pushing it. Why not? And I was like, oh, I'm kind of a new instrument pilot here. And I just, I wasn't quite sure. And he's like, then you asked for the ILS and, and they told you no. And you didn't, you didn't demand it. You didn't say that's actually what you need. You just accepted them pushing you around. I'm like, yeah, sir. He's like, don't you know that two months prior to you going through there, they vectored somebody into the side of a mountain, that same Tracon? Uh, no, sir, I didn't really know that. And so they chewed my butt out for a while, and luckily I wasn't in trouble over it, but I easily could have run into terrain because I was unsure. It didn't seem right. I got that feeling in my stomach. Something doesn't seem right. But I didn't feel experienced enough or knowledgeable enough to actually speak up and say so. I didn't want to seem like an idiot. And I could have easily had an accident because of it. What did I learn from it? You have to speak up. Just because you might look like an idiot doesn't matter. If something doesn't quite seem right, you have to speak up and you can ask a question. You don't have to issue a command to ATC. You don't have to say, no, absolutely give me the ILS right away. And no, I have to maintain this altitude. Even though you want me to go lower, I have to maintain this altitude. You can say, Are you, just confirm you want me to 4,000. Looks like there's some terrain in the area. And if you're still unsure, if you're getting a jip whiz warning, if you're getting some sort of train warning from your GPS, of course, you have to make a decision of what's safe and possibly follow that instead. That was a lesson I learned pretty early on in training or early on in my flying career. And luckily, it worked out well for me. Still scared the crap out of me, though. Now, why mitigate your speech? Is it because of what country you come from? No. It has nothing to do with what country you come from. They'll tell you that, oh, Brazil and South Korea has got really high power distance index. Morocco, yeah. And the United States has a low power distance index. And so does Australia and New Zealand. Sure, that's on average. That's a generalization. And like we said earlier, generalizations are not true. There are situations regardless of which of these countries you come from, any of the 192 countries in the world, where you will be in low power distance index situations, and you'll be in high power distance index situations. And it's likely that in aviation, you're going to encounter, encounter some high power distance situations. You're going to have to deal with them appropriately. Don't mitigate your speech. Don't hint. In the avionic, Avionca case, the flight engineer points to the empty fuel gauge when a flight attendant walked up on the flight deck and said, hey, we've been circling for like hours. Are we going to land soon? How much fuel do we have left? The flight engineer points to the empty fuel gauge and makes a throat cutting gesture with his finger, saying, nope, we're going to die. Didn't say it out loud because in Colombia, they chalk it up to, well, in Colombia, there's a high power distance index and the FE didn't want to speak up to the captain and FO. And it's pretty clear that the FO, being inexperienced, didn't want to speak up to a somewhat pushy New York air traffic controller. All right, when a Kennedy's air traffic controller tells Avianca 052 he wants them to go 15 miles northeast before turning back to begin another approach, he asks if they have enough fuel to do that. The FO replies, I guess so, thank you very much. They had four accidents that year at Avianca. They didn't have any sort of CRM training. They didn't teach them how to communicate. This accident, you can break it down to a lot of different things, bad weather, equipment problems, fatigue, bottom line is they didn't communicate. They didn't tell them, I need to go back to the airport now. They didn't tell them when they were in the hold, we need to land at a different airport. We can't make it to JFK. We need to go somewhere else. We need to land within half hour or an hour of fuel in our tanks. We can't get down to two or three minutes of fuel. That's not acceptable. They did not communicate clearly. Here's a lovely photograph from way back when of uh, me and my older sister when we were kids. She always used to tell me, I'm not bossy, I have skills, leadership skills. Do you understand? Well, that's a little aggressive there, but leadership skills are important. 
whether you're a captain or whether you're just an FO, or whether you're just a pilot-rated passenger sitting in an airplane, or you're the pilot. Whether you're dealing with other pilots as passengers in your airplane, perhaps you're just dealing with regular passengers, perhaps you're flying by yourself and just dealing with ATC. You have to have leadership skills. You have to make a decision, you have to be assertive, and you have to delegate. How I identify if I were to sit on a jump seat on an air, on an airliner at American Airlines, at Delta, at Southwest, at any of the majors that you can think of, United, if I sit on the jump seat of one of those airliners in the flight deck and I close my eyes and I've never met the FO or the captain, I can tell usually pretty quickly who the captain is and who the FO is, judging by how they talk. The captain will be sitting there asking a lot of questions to the FO. What do you think about the weather up there? What do you think about the weather over there? What do you think about uh, the EGTs on that uh, engine? What do you think about this? They've already formulated ideas in their head. They're asking, trying to solicit more information out of the FO, who perhaps isn't being very assertive with what the weather looks like up ahead because he feels like he's an FO and the captain is doing their very best to break down barriers and lower the power distance between the captain and the FO. You, when you're flying an airplane, and you have 500 hours or 5,000 hours, and you have somebody sitting next to you with 100 hours. You need to lower the power distance between you. You have to make them feel comfortable. You can even do things like downplay yourself. It was very common to get onto a jump seat or to get onto a flight deck in a CRJ that I was flying when you're first introducing the captain and FO, and I might get there first and the captain comes on, and sits down and he goes, hey, I'm, you know, Jim Bob and man, I've been on vacation for two weeks, haven't flown in a while. So if you see me do anything dumb, definitely speak up, you know, no worries. I do everything pretty standard and uh, follow a checklist. And if you see me do anything weird, don't hesitate to speak up. Don't hesitate to hit those brakes if you need to when we're taxing. Definitely keep an eye out. I haven't flown in a while. Not really that proficient. Whether that's true or not, he might have actually just come off a trip two days ago. It was common to see captains do this to lower the power distance between the captain and the FOs, especially in the regionals where you have guys coming from Cessnas and now they're sitting in the right seat of a jet with 60 or 80 people sitting behind them in the passenger compartment. Then you got these captains. Some of them are pretty new. A lot of them had a lot of experience. Same thing happens at the majors and same thing should be happening in our cockpits and our 172s. Make sure you're doing what you can to downplay the power distance between the two of you. It's, for me, when I go for a biennial flight review and somebody goes, oh yeah, I watch your YouTube videos. I'm like, yeah, man, but I make YouTube videos. I don't fly much anymore. And uh, yeah, I haven't been in a 172 in like six months or so. So make sure I don't do anything dumb here. Whether it's true or not, I'm going to try my best to downplay myself immediately because I want them to keep a close eye on me. I don't want to make... A mistake, them notice it and not say something. That would be the worst thing possible. Plus, I want to put them on guard right away. I don't want them to be relaxed thinking like, oh, John's got this. Or, oh, Jim Bob's got this. He's a captain. He's been here 10 years. He's got it. I can just chill out now. No, you have to be on your guard. You have to be on your A-game and you have to be willing to speak up. And it's our job when we're the top part of that power distance that we decrease the power distance between us and the other people. Same thing with our passengers. Of course, the passengers look at you like you're the pilot. You know everything. You could have 100 hours in your logbook, and they think you're Sully from uh, from Miracle on the Hudson. Your passengers don't know anything about flying. Hey, you guys should speak up. Let me know if you see me do anything dumb. I make mistakes too. If they start feeling uncomfortable flying with you, talking yourself up might bite you in the butt because now you're going to say you're so great that they're going to think anything you do is wonderful and they're not going to second guess you when you're possibly doing something wrong. I can tell you, regrettably, that there has been multiple times in my flying career that somebody that felt perhaps below me or inferior to me or however you want to say that there was a power distance between us, whether it was just me flying with a buddy and maybe I had more flight time than him, more experience in the airplane, or Perhaps I was flying with a student, and I was the CFI, and they looked at me like, oh, you're a CFI, you're God. And there's times that other people, other pilots have said something to me in an airplane, and I've ignored it or downplayed it. And I didn't create an atmosphere to make them speak up. Or perhaps they should have spoke up more aggressively, but because I didn't do a good job of decreasing the power distance between us, they didn't do so. And no, I didn't crash the airplane. No, we didn't die or anything. But 
it wasn't the best scenario, and the scenario could have been better if they would have spoken up more, and I don't blame them. I blame myself. It's my job to make others in my airplane and ATC and other people around me speak up and help me fly the airplane better, and it's your job to speak up when you're in the other role, when you're in the passenger role or sitting there in the right seat. So it's always going to be all of our faults, whether you're the pilot, whether you're a co-pilot, whether you're ATC, everyone has to take responsibility for the safety of flight. Now, talking about decision-making. Love this little one. Not sure if I'm carefully weighing my options or being indecisive. You need to gather information and identify the problem. Review causal factors with other crew members. State alternative courses of action. Ask crew members for opinions and options. Consider and share risks of alternative courses of action and talk about possible risks for course of action in terms of crew limitations. What can you really do here? What are your crew limitations? And confirm the selected course of action with your crew. Don't have that ambiguity of, oh yeah, we're gonna, you wanna go land here? Okay. And then you start flying over that way and they go, oh, what are we doing? It's not really clear. Make sure you always confirm what you're doing. It's why in the airlines, when somebody would set a new altitude on the autopilot, you would both point and you'd say, 3,400 for 8,000 or whatever it is. You would both point at the altimeter and point at the setting that you had bugged and confirm that so you were both on the same page. That was a big thing we did in the airlines to make sure that the altitude selected was going to be correct. And it worked in a number of different ways where you always wanted to confirm before actually entering something into the flight plan, before executing something in the FMS or in your Garmin 430 or in your Garmin 650 or whatever it is. Always confirm, make sure you guys are on the same page when, whether it's you and ATC because you're flying by yourself or whether it's you and your passengers or you and a passenger who's a pilot rated passenger. Make sure you're taking all those resources into account. Make sure you're drawing all the information out of them that you can. Ask questions and use words that will draw out more information from your pre-flight resources, from the weather briefer, from ATC. And we'll talk about that more in a minute of how to draw out more information. With your passengers, set passenger expectations. Make sure you give a, an appropriate pre-flight brief. Talk about the safety items on the airplane and talk about sterile cockpit when they should and should not be talking. Give them jobs to do. Don't let them just sit there and sleep. Make them look out for traffic. Say things like, hey, if you notice an airplane within a mile of us that, and you notice it first, before I do, I'll buy you a beer when we land. Make it a game. Make them a chart holder. Don't be juggling all these things on your lap. Make them hold your iPad or hold your chart for you. Make them read a checklist to you. Make them a zookeeper. Maybe you got kids or a dog in back. Make them take care of that. Don't be reaching back there and trying to deal with kids or a dog or something, especially in critical phases of flight like takeoff and landing. Make sure that they can take care of all those things for you. And under the zookeeper item, still falls in there, have them reach in back and get a water bottle. Have them reach around and grab something out of the back seat for you. Don't take your attention away from flying the airplane. Now we're going to jump into another scenario, and it's time for some brave soul, besides Patrick, to go ahead and call in and volunteer to chat with us about this. So we'll give you guys a minute here just to go ahead, dial up, and call in. Now while we're waiting for somebody to call in here, let's go ahead and talk scenarios. So... Your friend just bought a new plane, and he wants to take you for a flight. It's a light sport airplane, but you're both 200 pounds. You wonder a bit how close to gross weight it actually is. You ask him, hey, how close to gross weight are we? And he says, it's fine. That's the end of that. Put a stop to it, and you're like, uh, okay. And he said, it's fine. So I guess that's the end of that. It's a seaplane, and you both jump in and start water taxing out. You've only been in a float plane before. Not one like this, like what we see in the picture here. And you're really excited to go check it out and go fly in this thing. It looks super cool. I mean, look at the awesome job they did marketing this airplane. They get the guy and the crystal clear water and the girl and everything. And they're in the Bahamas and super cool. And wow, you want to be that guy standing on the dock there flying that plane. So you're super excited that your buddy was like, yeah, hey, come hop in my airplane with me and we'll go check it out. It's super cool. I just got it. It's wonderful. So... You taxi out in the lake, and it has uh, one foot waves or less. You know, it's a little choppy, but not too bad. It's got about 15 to 20 mile per hour winds blowing across the lake. And your friend says, well, the wind and the waves will help the plane get off the water easier. And you're like, okay, well, 
It's going to help us take off easier. That sounds good. Waiting on our next caller to call in. Just one moment here. And you tell your friend, and well, after actually you uh, go ahead and attempt two takeoffs in the airplane. So you're taxing down that lake and he gives it all it's got for oh, about 15, 20 seconds. Doesn't get off the water. Tries again. You look over at your buddy and you're like, hey, man, if we can't go flying today, won't break my heart. He says, ah, no worries. Let's try another part of the lake. And you're like, huh? Man, this seems sketchy. Okay, I already told him, like, we don't have to go flying. I, I told him, but it seems really sketchy. So you guys attempt one more takeoff. And you get off the water with the shoreline and the houses rapidly approaching. And your friend banks to the right to gain altitude. And while staying over the water, and there's our caller. Awesome. I'll be on here just a moment. So... Your friend banks to the right to try to gain altitude while staying over water, doesn't want to get over the lakeshore where there's a bunch of trees. The nose is really high, and the stall warning is sounding in the turn, and the turn is taking you over the trees on the lakeshore. And you're like, oh man, there's trees coming now. He keeps pulling back, trying to go up, and the plane mushes into the trees as it stalls. So what we want to talk about here, with whoever's brave enough to call in, is what is wrong with this scenario? What should have happened as we rewind this scenario where were the errors made? Aside from the obvious, oh, two big guys and a little airplane and not great weather and all these other things, in terms of communication, how could have communication avoided the airplane crashing? And is the scenario even real in the first place? We'll find out here in just a second. Well, I grab some water and wait to get linked up with that caller. Hey, Aaron, how's it going? Good, how are you, sir? Oh, doing very good. Thank you for calling in. So, uh, I know there's a little bit of lag between YouTube and uh, the live uh, chat here, so to speak. So, uh, were you able to get most of that scenario there? Uh, I got most of it, yes, sir. Okay, cool. So, what we're looking at here, ultimately, is, uh, well, if you don't mind sharing with everybody, since nobody really knows who you are, uh, how much do you weigh? Uh, I weigh 350. You weigh 350. Okay, so you weigh 350 and your buddy's 200. And he's going to hop in this really cool little float plane or little seaplane here with you. And you look over at him and you say, hey, uh, are we going to be uh, you know, close to gross weight here? And he says, oh, yeah, it's fine. And so that's kind of the end of that. And, and then you guys are taxing out and you're taxing out not the best weather. You know, the waves are about up to a foot, maybe less and 15, 20 mile an hour winds. And after he attempts two takeoffs, he still can't get the plane off the water. He just seems sluggish, seems kind of stuck to the water. And you look over at him and you're like, hey, man, if we can't go flying today, won't break my heart. And he's like, ah, no, it's, it's cool, Aaron. We're just going to taxi another part of the lake. We'll get off here just, just one more time. And you're like, man, this seems like a bad idea. And on the third takeoff attempt, he sets 30 flap and he actually gets this thing off the water. And he, of course, you know, as he's off the water, now you see the trees, the lake short coming. So he starts turning right, trying to stay over the water. And as he makes that right turn, Gets that nose real high, stall warns blaring, and he winds up trying to pull back, trying to avoid the trees on the lake shore, and just kind of mushes right into him, stalls and crashes. So, be a pretty bad day, eh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, ends really badly. Now, what could be done here, looking at this scenario, from a communication standpoint, what could we have done differently to not let this happen? I mean, obviously, you know, we got issues with weather and whatever and all that stuff, but looking at the communication where do you see that we could have done things differently? Uh, after you tell him, hey, if we if we can't go flying, it won't break my heart, just, uh, I guess, reiterate to him that you're okay again with not flying and, and I guess, give him a more affirmed answer than just, hey, if we can't go flying, don't worry about it. Yeah, I mean, you got a bad feeling in your stomach. I mean, you're not liking this, you know, and you're like, 
man, I don't know much. I don't know anything about this airplane, but from what I know about flying, you know, you got, you got some flight time and you're like, this just is not looking good. And so you tell him that. And then he's just, Oh no, we'll try it again. It might get to the point where you have to say, look, man, I'm just not comfortable. I I just, yeah. Yeah, and, and so I've, in that... I've actually had to do that in my plane as well. Yeah, and I go, hey, Aaron, don't worry about it, Aaron. Come on, man. It's cool. Like, let's let's go. You know, it, it, just one more time. And what are you going to tell him? I would, me being a pilot myself, I would just talk to him and be like, hey, I, I wouldn't want this in my plane. I know you don't want it in your plane. Yeah. i bring my pilot experience into it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And one thing, because... I've been in a very similar situation before, regrettably, right? And not listen to my passenger and take off anyways. And yeah, it all worked out, but you don't want to get into these situations. And thinking back to it, I'm like, man, why would I do that? Why did I push limits, especially with a passenger in the airplane? Like, God, what kind of a jerk am I? And I think back to it and I go, well, you know, I just felt like I didn't have any other options. I had promised Aaron I was going to take him flying in this plane. I just bought this plane. I bought it to show off to people because it's cool, you know, and I promised him it was going to be a cool time. And he says, hey, you know, if we can't go flying today, it won't break my heart. And I'm like, and I still am just tunnel vision because us as pilots, we get tunnel vision. You know, we got a goal. Our goal was to, for me, for John and Aaron to go flying today. And I'm just stuck on that. And so creating options for me and, and you say, hey, man, and come on, let's just get back to my place. We'll tie up the airplane. We'll wait for it to calm down. We can kick back, order some pizza. I'm pretty hungry right now. And you start creating options. And not that I would ever blame any of my passengers for not giving me more options, but that's why I made the choices I did. I felt like I didn't have any other options. I was committed to a plan, and I wouldn't uncommit. And so that's some of those things you can say. Like you said, you know, there's nothing wrong with the command statement. We're not flying today. Take me back. I don't feel safe. No. You know, but you ruffle some feathers that way. So you can work your way up from that hint of won't break my heart all the way up to, you know, hey, we got other options. We can just go kick back, wait for the wind to calm down and, uh, you know, order some pizza and whatever. And maybe in the meantime, while you're eating pizza, you read that POH and weight and balance. And you're like, oh, man, we're like we're like 75 pounds over gross weight. And maybe this isn't a good idea in the first place. And then all the way up to that command statement of, hey, we got we to gotta stop this. Now, anywhere else... Earlier on, uh, do you see anywhere that you could have spoke up possibly to avoid it? Uh, well, based on my weight and his weight, I could have asked uh, if it was if it would be within uh, the weight and balance of the plane. Yeah, so just ro- kind of role playing. So you ask me, Before hey, John, are we within it. weight and balance? And I say, y- it's fine. Are you good with that? Uh, I'd probably like to see. It, it, the answer was, it's fine. I'd probably want to see the, the weight and balance. Yeah, yeah. So you or might ask, say, "Hey," or, or ask him what the balance or weight and balance is. Yeah, you might actually ask him for some real numbers. Ask him to show it to you. Hey, man, um, I haven't done a weight and balance in a while. You mind, you know, showing me how it's done in this airplane and what the real numbers are? And that way, because it's hard for us. I mean, whether whatever culture you're from, I mean, you don't want to step on your friend's toes. He's he just went way out of his way to fly to this lake where you live, you got a lake house, he went way out of his way and already spent his time and gas to come get you. So now you feel committed to making this happen. You know, now you feel bad about trying to cancel the flight. And so, yeah, you can say, hey, man, mitigate it by, oh, I, I haven't done a weight and balance in a long time. I'd, I'd like to, you know, practice a little bit. Could you show me the numbers on this thing? And push him a little bit more because it's fine means that he thinks it's fine. I think it's fine. But I could just be saying, oh, it's fine because... If somebody else flew this thing 100 pounds over gross weight, it doesn't mean we're actually going to be at gross weight. Right. Yeah, so, no, ultimately, how this thing ended up, uh, does this uh, scenario ring a bell to you at all? No. Well, this one was actually a real scenario, and uh, this was in Michigan, so it's an Icon A5, and the scenario was a sales rep from Icon was going to sell this airplane to a guy that lived on the lake. The guy that lived on the lake was a pilot and they were, you know, they weren't skinny guys. They ended up when this was all said and done and they had the accident, the pilot, the sales rep was arguing with the NTSB, whether he was 30 pounds over gross weight or 50 or 70 pounds over gross weight. Really bad to be arguing how much over gross weight you are at the time of the accident. (laughs) Probably 
should have uh, done a little bit better pre-flight planning there. But ultimately, yeah. this guy, the sales rep, felt pretty committed. And the buyer probably felt committed too because this sales rep just went way out of his way to bring the airplane all the way over there. Took a lot of his time and gas to, to bring the airplane right to his house. And so now both of them feel committed to this plan. And it puts you in a tough spot, a really tough, a tough spot, that it's, uh, you know, it's hard to really say no to these guys, you know, to, you know, interrupt doing a flight. Ultimately, uh, you know, both people feel like the flight should happen. You know, feel like they somehow have invested in it or the other guys invested and they don't want to disrupt that. Um, but uh, like I said, there's probably a little bit of lag time here before real time and uh, what you actually see, uh, what you're hearing me say and what you see on YouTube. But you'll see this video here in just a second of the icon taking off from the lake, just barely struggling to get airborne. That was the third attempt at the takeoff. They finally get airborne. They come around in pretty gusty winds. They're overgross weight and they wind up mushing right into the trees. And not going to pick apart the guy's flying technique because he was pulling way back, really trying to clear those trees by probably more than he needed to. But I don't know that the airplane was going to actually stay in flight anyways. Uh, but he's trying to clear the trees the best he can and just puts it right into a stall and splashes down in the water. Luckily, they both survived. But a nasty situation. Um, now, uh, do you still see that video uh, showing there on your screen? I'm seeing it now. The, the plane's taking off now. Okay, cool. So there's a little bit of lag time there. But, um, no, that helps out. And, uh, yeah, ultimately, the next one I'll keep you on the phone here for is going to be looking at uh, an accident case study that we just did on our YouTube channel. Uh, we posted it maybe three or four days ago of a Mooney in Washington State taking off. And uh, what kind of airplanes do you fly, Aaron? I have a uh, 1971 Beechcraft Stunner. Okay, that's pretty cool. That's a 160 horse or 180. 180 horse, nice. Um, so yeah, I mean, and Mooney's got 180 horse. Um, Sundowner's not quite as fast as the Mooney, though, right? Uh, correct. Yeah, yeah, but it'll it'll it's got a little more wing on it. I think it'll haul more of a load. So the Mooney, a little higher wing loading to get the speed out of there. And this particular Mooney was 200 plus horsepower turbocharged. Do you see the uh, the video here of the uh, grass strip pulled up? Yes, I, I actually watched this uh, the, the YouTube video oh, okay. the other day when you debuted it. Cool. Well, I appreciate it. Did you did you give us a thumbs up? I did. Oh, yeah. awesome. Okay, good. Otherwise, we're gonna have, probably have to disconnect the call here. But uh, no, I appreciate that. So, uh, looking at the image here, when would you sitting in the right seat there? You know, so you're, you know, how much flight time do you have? Uh, hundred and fifty hours. Yeah. So you got hundred fifty hours, pretty good bit. And the guy sitting in the left seat, he's got twenty five hundred hours. At what point are you going to tell him abort? We're about looking at the uh, image here. We're about halfway down the runway. Right, um, and I know in the video you were talking about the seventy, uh, seventy forty. Is it? Uh, yeah, seven. They say yeah, seventy. Um, the seventy fifty rule, which is fifty percent of the way down the runway to achieve seventy percent of your rotation speed. And I couldn't agree with you more in the video where I want to be airborne at least, or at the very latest, halfway down the runway. Yeah, and that's the rule I use is 50% of the way down the runway, I am rotating and going airborne. If I'm not, if the airplane's not flying halfway down, we're aborting at that point. So, yeah, I mean, right. th now keep in mind, your buddy with 2,500 hours just flew all the way over here to help you out, to pick you up and give you a ride because you were too busy with wife and kids and whatever, so you couldn't drive to his airport. So he flew all the way over here, 20 miles out of his way to come get you so you guys could go on this golf trip. And you guys threw the golf bags in the back of the plane. You're rolling down the runway. So he's already doing you a lot of favors. When are you going to basically yell at him to abort the takeoff? I would say if it wasn't off in 1,000 feet, because that one I believe you said was a about 2,000 foot. foot runway. Yeah. Yeah, so halfway uh, down. Halfway, I'd be like, uh, there's something. It, it's, the runway's getting shorter, and we don't have much place to go. Yeah, cool. And in just the time it took you to say that, we probably just burned up another 200 feet. And now he's thinking right. about what you said. And and so that's what sucks, because now we're in this situation where there's times where we can, you know, we're sitting on the ground, we're getting ready to take off, and the airplane's covered in ice, and the FO can can kind of be nice and say, hey, we, we need to go back to the, what he needs to say is we have to go back to the de-ice ramp. 
and he can find a nice way to say it because there's time. In this situation, everything seemed normal. Run-up seemed good. You guys are rolling down the runway. And in that split second, you go halfway past and you look around. You're like, oh my gosh, we're halfway down the runway. We got to stop. Our only chance at stopping and not breaking this plane is right this half second. And so what you're left with is a command statement. It's kind of a jerk statement of abort, stop, you know, and you got to stay on the ground. I mean, at what point do you reach over and yank the throttle back and make them stay on the ground and press on the brakes? It's a tough spot. If it wasn't, if, if you didn't react shortly after halfway, I, I think I'd be pressing the brakes. And yeah, it's a really tough problem. spot. And the worst thing to do is be in a situation where he's got full power and you're pressing the brakes. And that actually happened in an accident in Russia in an airline where the FO is pressing on the brakes and, you know, captain's giving it full power. And, and that's what is so unfortunate. That's where at that split second, you realize it's tough. You can give a command and if they don't follow it, you might just be along for the ride. You know, as CFI, it's our responsibility to take over the airplane. But we have that nice pre-flight discussion with our students. I'm the pilot in command. I'm your flight instructor. And if I say my controls, you get the heck off the controls and I'm going to take them and I'm going to fix it. I'm going to give you a command to do something. And if you don't do it, there's going to be just enough time for me to fix it. It's my job as an instructor. But when you're flying with just a buddy, you don't have those talks always. You know, you don't even have a talk always. Who's PIC? It's kind of clear, like, oh, he's PIC. But it's hard. It's difficult to be in those situations. And the best case scenario here is, you know, of course, halfway down the runway, you can yell abort, you know, stop, don't take off. And he'll burn up some tires and come to a stop and maybe argue about it or whatever, be upset. The best thing is having that chat beforehand. These guys were overweight on the takeoff and they weren't making full power right from the get-go. It would have been a lot easier to tell them, at the start of the takeoff roll, because I believe that engine was only turning 24, 2500 RPM, not 27, to tell him right from the get-go, we're not making full power stop. Now all of a sudden he's reboarding the takeoff at 10 knots, 15 knots, instead of 60 or 70, and he's not tearing up his tires. And you got a lot more room in front of you. So thinking about these scenarios, sometimes the better case is a lot earlier. And the further into the situation, the further into the scenario you get, the worse your options get. Sometimes you're choosing between two crappy options. In this case, to yell abort or crash. Further on down the runway, once you get down somewhere, you know, towards the end of the grass, now your option is a high-speed crash or a low-speed crash. You know, how much energy are you going to take into the crash? You know, at this point, you're guaranteed to crash in the video. And luckily, he did chop the power. He said, okay, this isn't going to work. We're, we're crashing. Too bad that you couldn't have made the decision a little bit sooner. 100 feet sooner, 500 feet sooner. Still would have probably banged up the airplane, but nobody would have died in that one. And they got pretty hurt, in the two front seaters. So, yeah, I mean, you run out of options here pretty quickly. I mean, we are eight seconds into this video, and the option that they left themselves eight seconds in was a fatality and two broken backs. Eight seconds prior... The option was, you know, flat spots on tires. And 10 seconds prior, the option was hurt feelings between two friends. So it's tough. I mean, aviation's tough. <laughs> like, uh, I wish I could give everybody, you know, watching the, the perfect line to say or the perfect way, the easy way out, the easy button. It's not. I mean, that's what makes aviation so rewarding is that it is tough. But, um, yeah, that's... Uh, kind of it on this one i appreciate you calling in and playing along with us any questions so far on all this stuff no i just want to make a, a real quick statement this mm -hmm. video that we're seeing right now the, mm -hmm. the grass strip yep i was watching it in the living room my wife came down and she started watching it and she made the comment i never realized weight and balance was so important and yeah why you always harp on that and she's like i will not ever ask another weight and balance question again when you're sitting at the table and doing it before we take off so yeah, it's it's a big thing we Yeah, a big thing we don't do as um as pilots is communicate clearly to our passengers and and one thing that I've had several passengers do is we've got the free private pilot ground school and it's a lot, you know, to ask somebody to go through, but if you, you know, your spouse, your wife, she can go on our website and take that whole course for free. It's going to take her 30, 40 hours. She'll learn some things that's, and it, that's the course that I did to take my written exam and then I watch it again to take my uh 
Let's try to use that one as well. Awesome. And it's on there for free. She can go on and, and poke through it. And, and it's on there for those situations exactly. That's why it is free. It's for pilots, people that want to get a license, but also for their spouses, friends, anybody. And uh, and hopefully those things help because, yeah, I mean, that's that's the perfect example. And, I'm, and that's awesome. It's cool to hear that that um, that kind of helped you guys, you know, with your uh, with your flying as you guys fly together, that hopefully that'll <laughs> that'll take some of the heat off you. Yeah. <laughs> You'll still get in trouble for other things, but at least not weight and balance. You still have to do the dishes and everything else. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, cool. Thank you so much for calling in, Aaron. What's uh, what's your next rating that you're working on? Uh, I'm working on my instrument right now. Awesome. Well, good luck with it, man. Let us know if there's anything we can do to help you out. All right. Thank you, sir. Have a good night. Cool. Thank you so much to Aaron for calling in. Moving on here, we're going to talk a little bit about, and of course, everybody knows how this one ends. If you don't like graphic things and... Uh, in bad words, then don't bother watching this on um, on our YouTube channel, but we actually show the full video on there. That what takes you through that accident case study. But moving on here to confidence. Being confident enough, like we were just talking about, to speak up. And this is, of course, is a funny little joke. Why'd you become a pilot? Well, to overcome my biggest fear. Uh, heights? Nope, dying alone. Really, if you became a pilot, and most of us do not become pilots to make friends or impress our friends or seem cool to others, but it's part of it, right? It's one of those things that once you are a pilot, you want to take some friends flying. You want to show it off. You want to show your neighbors and have your neighbor go fly with you. Have one of your coworkers go fly with you. Take your kids flying. Take some of your friends flying. That's normal. You worked hard for it. You should do those things. You should do them carefully. Be very careful because our self-image is fairly fragile. I don't care how cool you think you are. We all have ego. We all fall into these traps of not being confident enough in our own ability. Think back to Aaron talking about it with his wife. His wife is saying, hey, I want to bring this bag. And he's like, nope, that, that, we got to take some weight out of that bag. Oh, really? Why can't, seriously? Is there not, we need a better airplane. We need a better pilot. When are you going to go back to training and get more training? Why, why can't, I can't take my shoes. Why can't I take this? Because weight and balance is important. <sighs> they don't understand. Of course not. They haven't been through the same experiences as us. They haven't seen the same videos as us. We have to be confident enough and have a positive enough self-image that we're not worried about losing friends or canceling flights or inconveniencing people when it pertains to safety. We have to be safe. There's no room for consideration in how inconvenient is this going to be or how much is this going to delay us. If it's in the interest of safety, you have to be objective about everything that you're thinking of and everything that goes into your planning. We said it in a previous video, aviation demands humility. It will hurt you if you are not humble. But really, aviation demands respect, and most importantly, aviation demands communication. And you cannot have effective communication unless you respect yourself and respect others. And you cannot have, a, it helps a lot to have effective communication if they respect you. And they will respect you when you stick to your values and stick to what you know and do not waver. And if you are humble and have humility, people will respect you. It makes it easier for you to talk and for you to communicate. And it makes it easier for them to communicate. It's hard to go up to the arrogant SOB at the airport and tell them anything. But it's easy when somebody is humble and you respect them, to run up to them and say, hey, is there taxing away? You forgot your fuel cap. Communication is the most important thing. Humility and respect enable communication and are things that we can focus on. This is bringing us towards the end of the presentation. For anyone who stuck with us through this whole thing, thank you so much. The keys here, because I don't want this to be ambiguous and just a lot of random ideas in your head, hopefully there's a lot here and food for thought for you, but the tools I want you to be able to take away are going to be paraphrasing, mirrors, labels, calibrated questions, empathy, respect, humility, confidence, and mitigated speech and how that feeds in, right? Having enough confidence to not mitigate your speech and knowing when you can mitigate it when you have a lot of time and you can phrase questions nicely and when you have to be more assertive and set, yell or say abort or go around and not suggest something, not hint at it. Paraphrasing in mirrors, where does that come into play? Paraphrasing simply means to repeat something back. So when your friend 
says, the weight and balance is fine, and you say, the weight and balance is fine, that will solicit him to say more. Yeah, no, we should be good. We should be good? You're just paraphrasing what he's saying, and that's making him talk more. Yeah, we should be good. I mean, we we'll, might be a little bit over gross weight, but this thing can handle it. Now you just found something out. We're going to be over gross weight. And you can say, hey, man, you know, based on the conditions today, I think if anything, we need to be under gross weight. Let's talk about this. Now you found out more information by paraphrasing or mirroring him, saying exactly what he says and making him talk more. Also, when you don't understand things, you can use mirrors. By repeating back what someone says, these were great with assertive, semi-arrogant people. They love to hear exactly what they said. They love to hear themselves talk, and they love to hear you repeat back exactly what they said, because it means you're listening, and they love to hear their basically their own words. So repeating those things back will make them talk more. So when you need to solicit more information from someone, when you say, what do you think about that uh, that thunderstorm up ahead? And they say, it's fine. You can say, that could be the end of the conversation, or you could say, it's fine. You could say, how is it fine? That's a calibrated question. Or labels. Labels can be things like you're looking at the weather radar, flying along a dead silence, and say, that thunderstorm up ahead looks pretty bad. You labeled it a thunderstorm, even though you don't know, you just know it's a radar return. That thunderstorm up ahead looks pretty bad. Now, you're going to solicit something from them. They could just stare at you blankly, but they'll probably say, oh, no, that's not a thunderstorm, that's just heavy rain. Now you've established what they're thinking. Why are they flying towards this red blob? Because they just think it's heavy rain. They don't think it's a thunderstorm, and you might disagree or not want to take the risk because you have reports of embedded cumulonimbus clouds in the vicinity. Based on that report, you're saying, well, we can't be sure, or you can say, how are you sure it's a thunderstorm? Now you have somewhere to work with, or somewhere to start, to start working on that problem. Paraphrasing, mirrors, labels, calibrated questions can work to improve communication or be a starting point to kind of energize communication, be the seed for communication. Empathy, respect, and humility will make communication easier and allow it to be clearer in an easier way. Everyone wants clear communication, but you and the other person don't want to offend each other. If you show empathy, respect, and humility, it'll be easier for them to be a little bit more direct without being afraid of offending you and likewise for you. And make sure you have the confidence and positive enough self-image to not be mitigating your speech. That's it on this presentation. If you guys have any questions on this at all, you can leave them in the comments below. We will go ahead and address those for you. And you can always email us at cfi at fly8mikealpha.com. If you have any questions on anything from private instrument, commercial, CFI, etc., tailwheel, seaplane, you name it, you can always email us there. Check out all of the courses on the website at flyatmikealpha.com. Complete ground schools, written prep boot camp, check ride prep boot camps for private and instrument and commercial, CFI, etc., Anything we can do to help you out with your flight training, let us know. You can also reach out to our office at 234-738-2582. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, guys, and we will see you in the next episode.